Good morning and welcome. Let's uh, begin today's class with a word of prayer. I want to request one of our students to kindly lead in prayer. So please feel free, anyone can volunteer. Can I pray? Yes, please tell us. Let's pray and believe. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to say thank you that you have allowed us to move the whole month of August. We are now in the month of September. Lord, thank you. We thank you that you have continued to teach us. Lord, how we wish that we will learn your ways. We will learn your ways so that we shall be able to experience your deeds. Lord, through these studies, that we will be able to understand the way you do things so that we will be able to follow you. And we pray for our lecturer that you will also give her the unction of the word of the Holy Spirit, that she will use the right vocabulary and that we will be able to learn. We pray for the internet and also the gadgets that they will have the necessary charges and even the internet will be stable and will not lose anything. And for those that have not yet joined, that they will be able to join so that we shall learn together. For in Jesus' name we pray and believe and rejoice. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So in the last class, we had started with the Acts chapter 6, and we talked about a particular uh, situation in the uh, family, the church, early church family, where uh, the Greek speaking Jews and the Hebrew speaking Jews, you know, they had a conflict uh, when it came to the feeding of the Greek widows. Uh, and that was a time when the leaders of the church, they uh, swung into action and they decided that they will use the power of delegation. So they picked uh, seven volunteers. Uh, the requirement even for the volunteers who ministered. Now, uh, if we look at some translations uh, in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, uh, it says daily distribution. And then in verse four, you would uh, see that you know they they use the term uh, ministry. They themselves, for the sake of uh, ministering the word, you know, they need to commit themselves to prayer and, and so on. Uh, but when you look at the daily distribution and the word ministry, which is used for the apostles themselves, it's the same word. You know, it's it's uh, from the root uh, that like uh, it, it's from the word diaconus. So one more thing that I just wanted us to remember is uh, though one is more of a, uh, an act of service, which is distribution, the other is more of working with the word and you know ministering directly to people in a, in a spiritual way you see that both are ministry both are services um, and uh, obviously both are services unto god so uh, again you know for us there's a big lesson to learn there that uh, when we serve god uh, nothing is too small or nothing is too great so we could be in spiritual ministry god honors that we could be in uh, some sort of an administrative uh, role god still honors that so ministry is ministry and we should look at it in that way uh, so yes we saw that seven men were chosen we don't read too much about uh, these men of course uh, we you know later on um, read about people like Philip and what they did, Stephen uh, and what he did, you know, but about everyone, obviously, as I told us when we started studying the book of Acts, it does not give us a complete comprehensive picture of everything that happened, all the churches that were planted, all the uh, influential or the uh, impacting believers of, of uh, the early church times, but 
it picks up for us primarily the works of the uh, apostles some um, uh, you know some uh, highlighted churches uh, and the focus later on will be more on the ministry of Paul, and as we, uh, you know, also said that it's possible that Paul had the focus in uh, uh, most of the writing of the Book of Acts because this would have been written as a defense brief, okay, during his trial. Okay, so we saw some good, uh, nice names over here. Seven of them who were picked um, for food distribution and uh, this also tells us that whenever there are challenges uh, in the church family uh, we must resolve it with the wisdom of god and that's what our uh, apostles here did and uh, because of the right kind of a solution the ministry continued but when we don't do that, you know, when we don't fight, try to find a godly solution, uh, a small issue can become a big issue. And sometimes those, those matters are the ones that end up dividing the church or causing offense in the church family. But this is beautiful to see that um, a matter such as food distribution was resolved so beautifully. Verse 7 uh, said that God's word uh, was spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So this was the manner in which the work of God uh, kept moving on. Now, we will read a little bit more about a person called Stephen. Now, what we know about Stephen is uh, that he was one of those volunteers. So obviously he was a man filled with, uh, you know, wisdom. He was full of the Holy Spirit um, and he had a good testimony. Those are the kind of people who were picked for volunteering. So that much we know about Stephen. What else can we learn about Stephen? So from verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. This again uh, gives us this understanding that when we look at the church, uh, sometimes we want to put all the uh, onus on the pastors, the leaders, the fivefold ministry offices, and we expect God to do mighty signs and wonders only through their lives. Uh, it's as if to say that God will not or cannot do miracles through the hands of believers. So somewhere we've uh, got this mentality. But as you look at what the Bible says, here is a volunteer. And the kind of work which he was engaged in was not directly, at least not what, you know, we don't see that in the passages uh, of the book of Acts. Stephen was into distributing food, which is more, uh, you know, uh, helps in nature but even then what do we read about Stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and signs among the people so you could in our language we can put it as an ordinary volunteer of the church is moving in signs wonders and miracles so uh, that really helps us see that all believers in the church can also walk in the supernatural. Just the way Jesus said, you know, John 14, 12, he said, you shall do greater works than these. That blessing is for every believer. Mark 16, and these signs will follow those who believe. They will speak in other tongues. You know, they will lay hands on sick and they will be healed. They will cast out demons. So the supernatural will be done by whom? those who believe which uh, refers to all believers and not necessarily only the uh, leaders or pastors so stephen ordinary believer as he is he is still moving in wonders and signs among the people uh, then verse 9 then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen uh, it enlists the groups there, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those 
from Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. Okay, so obviously, you know, Stephen is uh, a man full of faith yeah. and wisdom. So you have some of the opposing learned men of his times asking him questions. So uh, it does not only say asking questions, but disputing with Stephen. So maybe they raised uh, points of contention to prove Stephen wrong, to prove his faith wrong. Um, and you know, they wanted to bring an accusation on Stephen. Just the way you know they had, uh, we have seen earlier, they tried to get Peter into trouble, John into trouble, and uh, all the apostles also got into trouble. Similarly, it seems like persecution was beginning to take place. Earlier, we saw great grace was upon the church. Uh, people feared the church. People feared the leaders of the church. So they were accepting of what God was doing among his uh, believers. However, at the same time, there also seems to be a rising opposition. We saw, as far as the leaders or the council is concerned, initially they want, isn't it? And they let go of the apostles. But what if we read last? We read that in Acts uh, 4, we read that they plotted to kill the apostles. So uh, it's very clear that persecution is beginning to rise opposition is beginning to rise so it also looks like synagogue of the freedmen so we understand this is a lot of group they would have thought about the implications of letting the church folk thrive oh if these people grow they will spread the message of jesus everywhere it's a false teaching everyone will begin to follow them then what about you know, the existing authorities what about the the um, traditions of judaism so these are all questions in their minds uh, and maybe some of them genuinely were seeking god and they they wanted to find out answers to the questions which they had so they all came together and they thought okay come on let's debate this out let's let's dispute these things with the so-called believers and who did they uh, catch for these discussions a volunteer in the church stephen not even uh, the pastors or the apostles of the time but they got a volunteer now let's see how stephen responds to the questions which he is asked in verse 11 okay verse 10 it says and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke so isn't that amazing we can credit a uh, uh, an apostle maybe as oh, okay this person is anointed for the fivefold ministry offices and filled with the spirit of God. So they are able to uh, uh, give right answers to the questions which are asked. But after all, here is a volunteer in the church. But what does the Bible say about this particular volunteer? They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. That's the beauty of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So obviously Stephen was a man, as we've seen earlier, full of the Spirit, full of faith and power. You know, uh, very little written about Stephen in the Bible, but uh, even if you know little was written about you and me, we would be happy if the if the Bible said full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith and power, full of wisdom. So that is the testimony of this man called Stephen. So even the learned people could not stand his wisdom. Verse 11, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So when the right method doesn't work, which is to dispute and prove Stephen wrong, what did the uh, uh, what did these uh, you know uh, the set of people from the synagogue think of doing? Use the wrong method. That is to uh, lie about Stephen's stand and his conviction, and to just 
you know, put some blame on him, which is not true. So what did they say? They said, uh, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Now, things like this can obviously instigate the Jews. Why? Because Moses, we have seen earlier, he was a respected prophet of the Jews. No Jew will take this, you know, uh, sitting down. They will want to oppose and you know fight against a person who puts down their prophet. So Moses, and they also say that he is blaspheming God. Obviously, if uh, they did not spare Jesus, Jesus also, what was the blame? He said, look, he calls him father, right? And uh, he called, he tries to um, speak of his equality with God. These were blasphemous statements as far as the Jews were concerned, which is why they began to oppose Jesus. Now, what's happening? The same kind of treatment, remember? Jesus had mentioned this. He said, if they don't spare the master, will they spare the disciples? If the master goes through this, will not the disciples go through the same treatment? And so it's happening once again. Stephen is being accused of uh, false statements. Uh, so they say that he has uh, spoken blasphemously against Moses and God in verse 12. What did they do? They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. So obviously they needed a reason to uh, get him in their custody so that they could interrogate him further and they were so angry this time around we will see that uh, stephen was sort of stuck okay uh, uh, but how did they get hold of stephen with the line because uh, with the right kind of arguments with the right kind of questions they were not at all able to uh, yeah, sort of get something a hold on Stephen because his wisdom by the Holy Spirit was just so incredible. Uh, so all these lies. And you will notice from now that those who are in a position of leadership or those who are influential, from time to time we will read about uh, stirring up the people. So, you know, it, it's like what we see maybe in our times now, um, uh, where where mobs can be stirred up against a, a certain person or an ideology or um, we are familiar with, with such things happening so that is what these learning men followed they stirred up the people against stephen they seized him and brought him to the council and verse 13 they also set up false witnesses who said this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Okay, so as if it was not enough to accuse him of already a lie, which is he spoke blasphemously about Moses, he spoke blasphemously about God. What do they do now? Raise up false witnesses. So if you just want to sum up what's going on, all of this is like, you know, corruption. Um, uh, and uh, it, it is not pleasant at all. So now they have false witnesses and they're adding to the charges against Stephen. What are these charges? The charges are uh, this man spoke blasphemous words against this holy place. This holy place, obviously, in Jerusalem, we know that the temple of God uh, was established and people used to go to the temple according to the Jewish practices you know, at a set times to worship God. And the way they wouldn't stand blasphemy against Moses and God, they definitely would not stand blasphemy against their holy place of worship. And they add another point. They say against the law also. This man is speaking against the law. So four things that uh, supposedly Stephen was speaking against. Verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Okay, so I we just don't know if Stephen put things in this manner, uh, put across 
you know his ideas in this manner uh, or they just read in between the lines read between the lines and accused him of you know all these things so verse 40 we have heard him say that this jesus of nazareth will destroy this place and see destroy this place this is something jesus also said which had offended the Jews. So what's happening? They have memory of the words of Jesus uh, and they know that his followers have the same beliefs. So they're just connecting. It's all half and half. That Jesus said, you, you, uh, you know, this temple will be destroyed. I will raise it up in three days. So he was speaking in a figurative manner. Now in language, we use figure figure of speech, isn't it? It does not literally mean that the temple will be broken and raised up in three days. But what Jesus was saying was that his body, which will uh, uh, be destroyed through death, will be raised up in three days. So that is what Jesus meant. Now, these people are using half of what Jesus said and making it something completely different. And they're saying, Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, as if Stephen said that, and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. So where are these ideas coming from? We have no clue. But one thing is clear, they wanted something to trap Stephen. And here they have it. They've stirred up the people. They have raised up false witnesses. They somehow seized him, put him in front of the council, and you know they they just want to get rid of Stephen. Okay, because they're not able to do anything else through the right ways. So verse 15, and all who sat at the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the in face of an angel. Okay. So uh, isn't that beautiful? But even when we talked about the apostles who stood before the council, uh, Peter and John, they had uh, the people who were against God's people saw that these were unlearned men, these were untrained men. But how is it that they carry this incredible amount of wisdom? Similarly, when they saw Stephen in front of them, uh, what Luke is saying is they knew deep within that there was a divine grace upon this person. And so his face shone as the face of an angel now we don't know luke does not describe it in further detail we don't know whether the shine was um, just a sense of peace and tranquility which he carried or whether there was really uh, a divine glow on his face you know, which uh, talked of a heavenly glory we don't know but there was something divine about stephen in the midst of trial Okay, and that is the beauty of um, the way God carries you even through uh, difficult times. So let's see what happens in Acts chapter 7. So now entirely the, uh, the passage of Acts 7 is dedicated to what Stephen had to say and what is done to Stephen you know, at the end of his Def defense uh yeah we, we could call it a defense because he will try to share his views uh to tear down the accusations that have been made about him so i think i'll pause here for a bit just to check if you're all doing fine and if you have any questions or comments uh you know eh something that that you feel you're being ministered to or god is speaking to you about right now ah uh, yes go please uh, go ahead can you hear me yes um so i have this question when it, uh, in verse uh, 15 it says uh, that his face became, I and mean, this is NLT translation. It says uh, his face became as bright as an angel's, right? So, like, 
how how would they know the face of an angel is it like um uh, is it like an inner uh, knowing from the spirit or like they've seen it and they are uh, testifying to it yeah yeah good question uh, akum see uh, when we talk about the jews we know that they are familiar with angels because even their father abraham uh, he had encounters with angels isn't it and so uh, so this whole description of angels and how they are uh, they would have learned it you know it would have been passed on to them verbally and in the form of stories so that is why they are familiar so when when they saw uh, a certain sense of peace and um, uh, a glow on the face of stephen they immediately connected it to something divine and therefore they just said that it seems like an angel okay so uh, that does that help in some way yeah faster uh, and i have one more question yeah. like um if uh, so like for that's for the jews for us would we know like um would we know like if uh, that like in our present time now like if it is if a person's face is glowing like that can we have that inner knowing that it is um like from god like i don't know <laughs> yeah something like that um yes kum so uh, for us i think we can when we do recognize uh, that someone's face is shining obviously the jews we could say that they they had ex, they had uh, uh, immense experience you know with with moses's face shining uh, you know all, all those things so they they knew what what this was supposed to be i think for us it's more of uh, hearing from the holy spirit um, it's more of us uh, getting the confirmation from the holy spirit so we would go by what we see in scripture uh, i think it's romans uh, 8 and verse 16 the spirit bears witness with our spirit okay yeah that's right so or in other words the spirit itself testifies with our spirit it uh, scripture says uh, so then you know if something is divine the holy spirit will confirm that to us so when when we see someone uh, not just someone's face glowing but you know something divine going on somewhere deep within for a believer we know it's hard to ex it sometimes we can explain it sometimes we can't but uh, there is that inner knowing where the holy spirit bears witness with us so we can is that okay cool Yes, Mr. Thank you. Okay, great. That's nice. Yes. Uh and anything else uh, class I know the last two sessions were quite you know continuous like an express train so I hardly stopped. So if you had anything to talk about this would be a good time. okay so seems like uh, you know you're all thinking about what you're hearing uh, that's that's fine also so let's proceed acts chapter 7 so we said now stephen has been brought before the council uh, and uh, he will be interrogated so how is he going to answer so far the spirit of wisdom was at work in him uh, how is he going to give a defense for himself okay uh, he has been accused of what he has been accused of blaspheming against moses against god against the holy place against the law uh, so what is stephen going to say um you know to one is defend himself and also proclaim the truth so we have seen so far that everyone who had an opportunity to speak before audiences uh, did it to proclaim christ did it to speak the truth 
so you would notice that in what Stephen speaks, uh, there is going to be defense, but also, you know, some work of the kingdom. He will definitely tear down the so-called traditional ideas which the Jews carry, which now have been um, changed because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, Jesus said that you cannot pour uh, the new work of God in the old character. So new wine cannot be poured into old wine skin. So the Jews with their old traditions cannot continue to pursue and seek God. And Stephen is quite vocal about these things. So there is going to be defense, but there's also going to be truth spoken. Uh, and, and we will see how uh, Stephen really takes this up. So this entire chapter uh, is, is about uh, Stephen speaking up. Uh, and one more thing is there will be, um, you know, some names from the Old Testament and occurrences from the Old Testament. So you, know, you don't have to get uh, confused or you know, derailed by, by all the details. They're just trying to get the essence of what he's trying to say. So let's start off at 7 and verse 1. It says that the high priest said, are these things so? So at least four main points uh, are being said about you, Stephen. Is that so? And verse 2. And he said, so he starts off his explanation. And it's a rather long explanation. He says, brethren and fathers, so what is he doing? Just like Peter, just like uh, him establishing a connect with the audience, brethren and fathers. So he is from that Jewish culture and he establishes uh, a familiarity, he establish, uh, establishes a connection so that the listeners are uh, you know, they they are accepting of what Stephen wants to say. So he doesn't begin with saying enemies. No, that's not the way. But he says, come on, I'm one of you, brothers. And he's also respectful towards the council, and, which is why he says fathers. So the people who are, um, you know, established in, in their own right, the people who hold positions of authority, he, he addresses them with respect. He says, brethren, and Fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. So what is he saying? Look, he is talking as one of them again. Our father Abraham, you know, this God, we are familiar. So your God is my God. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. So basically, what he's saying is, remember he's been accused about the holy place. That, you know, he said something about the holy place, like, you know, don't revere the holy place, don't uh, worship in this place. Something blasphemous about the place of worship of the Jews. But he's helping these Jews get a new perspective that it's not about the physical place. Remember, Jesus also uh, gave a new perspective to that Samaritan woman. when she said, our fathers worship on that mountain. You know, where do you worship? Where do your people worship? But Jesus brought about a new thought in her mind. And that thought was, it's not where do you worship, but how do you worship? Worship in spirit and in truth. Similarly, that's what Stephen is saying here. He's saying, you're so worried about the place. But can you imagine, much before this place existed, and uh, you know, way before the significant people that we associate with this place began to follow God, you know, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. So where did he appear to Abraham? Was it in this place or where, where did he appear? But Abraham did have an encounter with God, but that was not so much about the place where he was. So uh, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. And when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, 
get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. So way before the promised land, Abraham had an encounter with God. So God is beyond your promised land where you are worshipping him. Okay, so he's talking like that. We'll see where he's going with all of this. Verse 4. So about Abraham, then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. Okay, so God encountered Abraham in another land and then gave him a call. Abraham may be hesitantly followed God. Now, some people say that because God, what did God tell Abraham? Leave your father's house, you know, come out from among them, right? So God called Abraham out, but still you notice that he lived in Haran and he lived with his father till his father was dead, okay? So it wasn't like Abraham courageously jumped out right away, leaving his father's household and moving to the promised land. But anyway, Abraham made his own journey. He came to Haran. There his father died. Then he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. So eventually, you know, Abraham came to the land where God was pointing him. Verse 5. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. Okay, so we'll read further. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in the foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. So basically he's talking about the journey of Abraham, uh, the promise of Abraham. Uh, and he's saying you know, how God promised him a land. Uh, but obviously we, we also understand that you know, uh, it was a journey which he had to make with his descendants. So uh, while he was alive, yes, he did not, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the sense that we uh, we think, okay, Abraham, we won't possess the entire land. But that's not the way it happened. Uh, but, you know, he came and uh, uh, we know that, you know, he once he was gone, his descendants uh, also went into captivity and God had told that they would, you know, God under captivity, uh, under the Egyptians, and then God again brought uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham's descendants out of that bondage. So he's kind of narrating the story, but the the point he you would you would notice later he's making is see God was with these people all along. God was with these people, and uh, the hue and cry about this place where you worship. Uh, you know, God's God, us worshiping God and God encountering us, it can be beyond a so called physical place, okay, that the Jews hold so dear to them. So, that is the new perspective which Stephen was trying to uh, bring about. So, he narrates this history about Abraham and his descendants and how God promised him Isaac, how, uh, you know, they went into, the descendants went into bondage, they came out of the bondage, how God made a promise with Abraham uh, and as a symbol uh, of, of the covenant which he had with Abraham, he also asked him to uh, circumcise Isaac and uh, Abraham obeyed him. And then he carries on from there, he begins to talk about uh, other men of God. So he says, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. So he's beginning to talk about the story of Israel. Okay, who are these patriarchs? What is patriarchs? Patriarchs is a term used for um, the, the men uh, of, of history, you know, religious history that the Jews um, 
honored. So you had people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're all termed as patriarchs. Okay, verse 9. And the patriarchs became envious, patriarchs becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. So again, he's beginning to narrate, and somehow he's talking about Joseph now. And Joseph, who was now in that period, you know, those 400 years of, of uh, uh, slavery that, that we talk about. So all that is going to unfold. But who is one very prominent person you know, when uh, that uh, period, period sort of unfolds? That is Joseph. Uh, but he says, look, God was with Joseph. Okay, So that's his point. So God was with Abraham. Abraham encountered God, and God was also with Joseph. In verse 10, he says, And delivered him out of all his troubles, and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. So where is all this happening? All this is happening in Egypt. Joseph is making his journey with God in Egypt. So the presence of God is with Joseph where? In Egypt, not in this, you know, your your place of worship. So verse 11, now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him. 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. So he's going into these details, but the key thing he's saying is, look, God was with all these people and God was journeying with them. So it was not necessarily about a particular place. But at this point, I also want to remind us, uh, when you look at the Pharisees, you look at the Sadducees, you look at uh, all those people of the synagogues who were learned and they probably knew the Hebrew scriptures. Stephen, he may not have come from that line of learned men but his desire for God has caused him to study the word what was given to uh, the people during his days you know the scriptures which were available he seems very familiar nobody uh, can can preach with details like this unless they have been reading the scriptures you remember when we talked about the early church what did we say you know they they uh, they spent time in the apostles doctrine uh, they dedicated themselves to the apostles doctrine so stephen one of the believers in the church do you see how well he has been discipled how beautifully he knows the scriptures he probably read the greek version of the early scriptures, you know, it's called the Septuagint. So uh, that's where you know, some people debate about the number of people in Jacob's uh, family, the relatives. It is supposed to be 70 if you total it in the Hebrew, but the Septuagint, you know, it, it puts it at 75. So it's likely that he was reading the Greek version of the scriptures, but whatever said and done, uh, uh, as a child of God, there is so much to learn from Stephen. He's standing before a council. He knows that these people know probably better than him, you know, the history that he has just narrated. But for us as believers, it just tells us that he knew his Bible. He knew his, uh, you know, uh, scriptures. He knew the gospels. How many believers do we have like Stephen? If asked a question, we can say, okay, wait, let me tell you. This is what Paul said in Corinthians. So this is what uh, Jesus said in the book of John. And this is how the whole thing unfolded. Do you see the details here? Stephen read the scriptures. And he knew the scriptures enough to share and talk about it. So what a beautiful uh, believer. And, you know, he's not yet a leader. Uh, Nobody is calling him a leader yet. 
somebody who's like ordinary believer is so familiar with the scriptures and uh, that is an inspiration for us okay so we can move forward verse 17 but when the time of the promise drew near which god had swore to abraham so this is about the promised land okay so uh, when the time of the promised drew near which god had swore to abraham the people grew and multiplied in egypt till another king arose who did not know joseph this man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own, own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So giving a little bit more of history. He covered Abraham, Joseph. Now he's talking about Moses and how the whole, uh, the whole story unfolded of the possession of the promise that God made to Abraham of the promised land. So now Moses comes into the picture. So God raised up another man to fulfill that promise. Verse 23. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So it's talking more about the life of Moses. Okay. Uh, so obviously, for 40 years, Moses is growing up in uh, wisdom. He's growing up in his learning in Egypt. Uh, till such time, though he knows that you know, he's a Jew and God has a destiny for him, uh, so, something for his people. But where is Moses growing up? He's growing up in Egypt. How is he growing up? He's growing up as somebody else's son. Okay, He's growing up as the son of uh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter. But his real destiny for the kingdom, you know, that is not yet unfolding. Okay, uh, So now, when he is 40 years old, that's the point where you know, sometimes even in our lives, uh, though we have an idea like, okay, God has something for me to do. But it's in that Kairos moment, you know, the right time that clarity comes into our spirit and we know exactly, oh, great, you know, this is what I need to do for the kingdom of God. So when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So finally, he's like, okay, this is what I got to do. I have to visit my brothers who are outside of the palace. So verse 24, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian for Verse 25, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Okay, so what this is showing us is that when Moses understood his purpose, he tried to do something about that purpose on his own. And he thought that others also will understand. But that was not the case. He tried doing it in his own strength. He tried doing it in his own wisdom. And the hearts of the people were not prepared. So when we get clarity about what God wants us to do, that may or may not be the right time to do it. Okay, so that's the lesson we learn. The moment Moses knew what he wanted to do, what did he do? He just jumped into it. And when he saw one of the Jews being oppressed, he went and murdered, right? And he thought that the other Jews would be supportive of him. But that was not the case. Verse 25, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand. So knowing what God wants us to do and doing it, right? Uh, we really have to seek God to do it at the right time. And just because we know, uh, if we we shouldn't you know, jump into uh, things. All right. So what we'll do is we'll break at this point. We'll take a ten minutes break. Uh, even though all this sounds heavy, uh, I want you to appreciate the knowledge of Stephen. 
Okay, so I know that we're not going into all the small details, but there's incredible truth you can gain just from reading the details that Stephen has mentioned. Uh, but then, you know, we won't do that. We won't read too much into what he's saying. The essence of what he was saying is, you know, God has kept his promise. God has walked with his people even outside of your so-called holy place that will make such a big hue and cry about. Okay, so uh, let's, um, you know, uh, end here for the session. We'll come back in 10 minutes and continue from where we stopped. Thank you.